have questions and you want answers. Welcome to the Q&A show. Hi, good evening and welcome to Revelation TV's Q&A show. It's live, it's uh, Thursday evening and tonight is going to be a really exciting one, especially for me because I've interviewed this uh, gentleman a long time ago when I first started to make programs and uh, well before Revelation TV was a channel. His name is Ken Ham, and I know that many of you will be familiar with Ken. Ken is the president and founder of Answers in Genesis and also uh, the Creation Museum, which is down there in Cincinnati or on the borders of Kentucky. So if you want to uh, put your questions that you've longed to put to somebody uh, in this stature uh, of looking at creation rather than evolution, uh, there's many of you out there would love to be able to put some sensible questions because you Watching Revelation TV, don't ask me why, because you don't agree with this, and that's brilliant, because I love those uh, sort of people that really want to search for truth. And uh, nothing to be afraid of tonight, because Ken Ham is a gentleman, and I'd like to welcome you to him. Welcome, Ken. Hey, hi, Howard. It's great to be with you again. Looking forward to being over in England, actually very soon, too, and, uh, and Northern Ireland, when I'll be uh, speaking over there in the early part of August. Right. Well, maybe before the end of the program, you'll give us some dates for our viewers, because I'm sure they'll love to make a note of that in their diaries. Now, Ken, uh, it's uh, probably been a couple of months or so since we last had you on the channel. Um, just anything that uh, comes to mind that, you know, you could really start the ball rolling tonight, uh, whet some appetites out there. We've got a good few atheists and agnostics and also people that are searching and Christians that are a little bit embarrassed to be able to make a defense for the creation stance that you take and that I take. And, and often we're not uh, as well equipped either, you know, sort of with all the information or just don't have that sort of intellect that can deal with the sort of questions that come at us and us sort of undermine our faith. So we really need to be educated in such a way that we're ready to make a defense for the faith that is in us. So help us tonight. What would you say, uh, since we last spoke, as some of the things that have come to light that uh, would help us uh, to counter the arguments uh, that are put forward for evolution as a means of creating us as humans? Well, well you know, Howard, it's very interesting, but really, uh, you know, there's been nothing new come forward in the evolution arena. I mean, really, I, what I'm finding in recent times is that the secularists tend to be more, you know, name calling and so on, because a lot of the things that they brought up in the past in regard to the fossil record or supposed transitional forms and so on, I mean, creationists have, have uh, answered those in all sorts of ways. I mean, one of the things that really hit the headlines recently, of course, was the uh, Higgs boson particle, you know, that they think they may be perhaps found and so on. And they're talking about reconstructing what happened at the Big Bang or microseconds after the Big Bang. And of course, it's a reminder to people that you know, those people weren't there to see the Big Bang. Here they used their intelligence to build this incredibly complicated bit of uh, technology uh, to try to find some sort of particle. And even if they did find some sort of particle, even if that's so, I mean, you know, some of the headlines here in America anyway were that, oh, they're, they're, they're back showing what happened at the beginnings of the universe. Well, no, they're not. They're just discovering some sort of particle in the here and now, if, it, if they really discovered that. And it, it really doesn't say anything about what happened at the beginnings of the universe. I mean, they might have a story about what they think happened, but it, it's just amazing uh, some of the statements that we see. And, you know, I was just uh, also watching a video today of one of your uh, well-known people over there, Dr. Richard Dawkins, who started, started off his lecture at the uh, Reason Rally, Reason Conference over in Australia in Melbourne in April by saying he wanted to take back morality and redefine morality and, and make morality into what they think it should be. Uh, which I think really is the bottom line with the whole creation evolution issue. In other words, we want to decide right and wrong for ourselves. Sort of reminds me of what the Bible says in the book of Judges, when they had no king to tell them what to do, they all of it was right in their own eyes. Because really, from the perspective of Richard Dawkins, who claims to be an atheist, sort of, 
Uh, and uh, even though he knows he doesn't have all evidence, so he can't be 100% sure he's an atheist. But regardless, how does he decide what's right and wrong? Who, how can he use words like right and wrong? It's just his opinion and opinions of others that he can gather around him. But, but really, there's been nothing new that's really come forward. I mean, the basic arguments are, are there. Uh, creationists have given lots of answers in geology, biology, and so on. And uh, we continue to do our best to get that to the public because what's happened I find through the much of the education system, through much of the media, which is why I really praise the Lord for you doing what you do, is that a lot of the information is censored and a lot of people don't know about these answers and don't have uh, the information. And that's why we, through our website and through avenues such as you know interviews like this, are getting out the information that people don't tend to hear. Great. Now, the thing is that with the Higgs boson and all of that, you know, they, 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 at least they say that they're looking for the God particle, the God factor in all of this. Um, how true that is, I don't know, but they, they at least give some credence to the fact that well, there think, could I be think, a God. I th well, I think originally, the, the, the reason they called it the God particle, in a way I think it's a sort of an embarrassment for them, but I think it was something to do with a word that uh, is not... It's not only a word that we would we would like to use in normal language that was used originally, and they shortened it to the God particle, and it really had nothing to do with God, the origin of that particular term. Hmm. Uh, tonight, I just want to remind our viewers that we'll be looking at uh, your questions and comments, and they, some of those will appear on the screen. Uh, so please uh, do start sending them in. Uh, we do want to keep the questions to the topic, and uh, that is with regards to what Answers in Genesis is all about. If you've got questions on the book of Genesis, particularly uh, the beginning there from chapters 1 to 3, uh, and also if you want to talk about other things that are related to the origins of man. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ken Ham has been um, around for many years and is very au fait with uh, a lot of the arguments that you would have to... Uh, put forward uh, if you were asked uh, to make a defense, as I said earlier, uh, for the faith that we have in the Bible. Now, coming to this, uh, Ken, you know, just what was it like for you in the beginning uh, when you were sort of studying the scriptures? Uh, I know that you have, a, you know, your family was, uh, you know, Christians, so it wasn't so quite so hard for you coming in cold, as it were, in your 20s or 30s. But, you know, what was it for you that really um, changed your mind or helped you to be so convinced um, that God is our creator and that we we didn't evolve. Well, you know, I, Howard, I was brought up in a Christian home with a father who taught, he never used the word, but he really taught, taught apologetics. I mean, when I was a young kid, we had some of the Just more liberal pastors telling people that, you know, uh, the Israelites might have walked across six inches of water and try, trying to explain away the miracles and so on. And my father was continually bringing up objections to that and answering from the scriptures and, and that sort of thing. So I was brought up with this sort of apologetics bent of, you know, a father and mother who, who were defending the Christian faith. And uh, then, you know, as, as a kid, of course, you know, going to school, going to high school, uh, I, I mean, I was first introduced to teaching of evolution and millions of years when I was in grade eight high school in Australia. And it, it didn't make sense to me because you know, when, when you look at even design in the human body and design and other creatures and so on, it didn't make sense to me how things could e evolve by chance, random processes, particularly have all these connected systems and, and that sort of thing. And not only that, really, when you, when you really read about evolution, I mean, I found this when I went to university. When I went to university, I, I mean, I, I started to realize that that they, what they're really doing is trying to force a particular belief on the evidence because you can't just go direct to the evidence and, and see all these branches and so on. They, they talk about some bits of bones and, and then they start to interpret those. And of course, we've had the issues of the so-called ape men over the years and finding out, you know, beginning with Piltdown Man that was a fraud and some of the others that have come along and realize they've interpreted them incorrectly. And I, I guess I've always really understood there's a big difference between observational science and that is what you can do in the present to build our technology and historical science which is knowledge concerning the past and 
for some reason, you know, you know, that's one of the things that I always used to be looking at. Okay, what do we actually have and what are they actually adding to it? You know, you might dig up bones of a dinosaur, but they don't have a label saying how old they are. So how do they know how old they are? And when they use dating methods, yeah, but yeah, but how do those dating methods really work? Aren't they don't they have some assumptions? How do you know those assumptions are really valid? So I guess I was questioning like that. My teachers never really had answers and couldn't definitively say for sure. I mean, you know, what they ended up doing in those days, and this is, you know, you're talking a long time ago, you're talking 50, you know, 45 years ago or so. I remember my teachers saying, well, anyway, it's just a theory. Of, of course, you know, I, I, I would say things differently today in that regard, knowing, you know, what a theory really is. But they meant it was just something that maybe it's not correct. And, uh, you know, and when my teachers respond that way, I start to realize, well, how do they really know this? And and then as a Christian, when I came across a book that helped me understand that, hey, the Bible makes it clear, death, bloodshed, disease, suffering, thorns came after sin. Wait a minute, the fossil record uh, that's said to be supposedly millions of years before man has got, or is a record of death, bloodshed, thorns, diseases. How could that be millions of years before man sinned? And so then I realized as a Christian, the conflict between that and what the Bible clearly teaches. So, you know, those are the issues that affected me as I was going through school and, and university until I started to really understand this issue even more as a, as a teacher. Mm. Very good. Um, our, one of our first questions that's come in is uh, can, well, regarding the ark. Let me read the, from Alex here. He says, do you think definite proof of Noah's ark will ever be found? i.e. the actual ark. Let me just stop there and uh, let you answer that, Ken. Well, um, I, I could answer that in two or three different ways, actually, and I'd, I'd like to approach it in a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, as far as I know, there, there has no find uh, that I would say that anyone you know, in our present day can point to to say that they found Noah's ark or bits and pieces of Noah's ark. Uh, I know there's been some claims in recent times that we think uh, are, are not correct at all, and uh, based on uh, wrong information. But, you know, the Bible, people say, you know, should the ark be on Mount Ararat? The Bible doesn't say Mount Ararat. It says the ark landed on the mountains of Ararat, so we don't know which mountain it landed on. Uh, our geologist, Dr. Andrew Snelling, as a PhD in geology, said, you know, he, he thinks it's unlikely it is the Mount Ararat for a number of reasons. And even if it was, you wouldn't expect to find the ark there because it's been built up over the years by massive volcanic action and also, you know, earthquakes and so on. So even if the ark did land there, it's not likely uh, that it would have survived. And, you know, think about it. Think about all the wooden structures from some of the ancient civilizations. I mean, you go back 4,300 years to the flood. I mean, even when, you, when you're going back to some of the ancient cultures, I mean, even their stone structures and so on, there's not much left of them. I, I, think, it'd, it, it, I think it's not likely that, uh, you know, the remains of the ark are there. Uh, if they are, they'd have to be so preserved in some special way or petrified or something like that. Mm -hmm. But another aspect of this that I think is important, you know, people think, oh, but if we find Noah's ark, that'll convince people that the Bible's true. Well, I would say, no, that's not so. I remember an atheist once said to me, even if I found a boat on the top of Mount Ararat and dragged it down the main street, and um, I'm still not going to believe it's Noah's Ark. You know, you know, maybe the maybe the priests built something up there or, or whatever. And it reminds me of Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man died and went to a, a place separated from God, and Lazarus, this beggar, died and was with Abraham, with God, uh, in, in what we would call heaven. And the, the, the rich man wanted to go back and warn his brothers about this place of torment, and he wasn't allowed to him, and he said, he and, it. And, and he said, uh, it, well, if Lazarus went back to them dead, they'll repent. And he said, if they don't hear what Moses and the prophets wrote, not will they be persuaded if one rose from the dead. So even if we have Noah's Ark or the evidence, they're not going, they're not going to believe anyway. That's the point. Mm -hmm. uh, well said. In fact, you've answered most of the other questions and points that Alex was going to put. So well done. Uh, whilst we're on the Ark, let me, you know, we, 
we do have an animation that we might be able to use that uh, one of our guys here did recently. But there's been quite a lot in the news about uh, a Dutch family that's done a replica of Noah's Ark and uh, taken it to the, the biblical sizes, which has been quite a, a feat. And they did it. I think it only took them a few years to actually build this, you know, less than 10. I can't remember exactly. Do you, have you heard much about this? Yes, I, I've heard. In fact, one of our people have visited because we have a project here in America called Ark Encounter, uh, where you know we we built the Creation Museum and opened it in 2007, and now we have 800 acres on the biggest right in interchange on the on, on the busiest north south interstate in America, Interstate 75, and we're going to be rebuilding Noah's Ark, the size of the Ark out of wood. Uh, it's going to be different to the one over there in the Netherlands. This one's going to be built as as a real boat would be built, so to speak, with uh, as, as some of the ancient boats were built with uh, classy uh, walk-through exhibits like we have here at the Creation Museum. And uh, so, you know, we were very interested to see what he built. So, uh, you know, one of a couple of our people actually went over there and visited it, and it's built on barges. And you know, I, I admire him for doing that, and I think that's great, and it gives a perspective uh, of the of the size of the ark. Uh, so it's it's interesting how you know different people are uh, you know doing these sorts of things at the same time uh, around the world. I, I think it's really uh, the Lord you know challenging people concerning. Uh, the history in the Bible and therefore the gospel based in that history. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're still searching for the piece of animation that I was going to hope to show. But again, we're doing this on the fly, as it were. Uh, but let's go on to another question that's been uh, put, put to us. Um, slightly different. It's quite interesting. Jesus, uh, the writer says here, was sinless, therefore could not die from old age. At what age did he stop aging is the question here. He was around 33 when he was crucified and he'd already stopped physically aging some years had he already stopped uh, physically aging some years before if hypothetically he stopped aging at 23 and he was crucified later at say the age of 33 surely people would have noticed he'd stopped aging uh, it's very hypothetical of course be, uh, but what would you say to that Ken it's not necessarily on topic <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not really on topic I mean you know we know that a, a absolute miracle uh, that God stepped into history in the person of his son to become Jesus Christ, the God-man. Now, he was born as a baby, obviously, so he is 100% human, so we have to remember that. He was 100% human and 100% uh, God at the same time, and he didn't have a sin nature. He was uh, perfect, 100% perfect, and you know his line, uh, although Joseph uh, is Mary's husband, of course, we know he was born of a virgin because it was God's uh, Holy Spirit that overshadowed Mary so that uh, God's son would be uh, born that way as a human. And, you know, there's a lot in the Bible we're not told about these sort of things. And so, therefore, I would rather not comment too much. I wasn't there <laughs> and I didn't, didn't see him. But uh, we do know that he had a sinless nature. Uh, and we do know that he remains the God-man for eternity to be our saviour. I mean, it's absolutely miraculous. And, you know, where I think, what I think we should be concentrating on is understanding, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus is called the last Adam. He takes the place of the first Adam. And, you know, we have people in our churches today, and there's people in England in Christian leadership. And I'm not saying they're not Christians, but they're saying that, you know, there wasn't a literal Adam and there wasn't a literal Eve. Uh, actually, a literal Adam, the first at man, Adam, uh, that's who we're all descendants from. That's why we know we're sinners. And Jesus Christ is called the last Adam because through the first Adam, uh, the first Adam's sin came death, and through the last Adam's death comes life. And so we need to understand, I think the important thing is uh, that uh, we have a literal first Adam and we have a literal last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, and exact, exactly the nature in regard to his physical body and so on. We're not told a lot of those sorts of things. So I, ju I just leave that to the time we get to heaven to ask the Lord some of those answers. Right, thank you. Uh, we have Ken Ham with us tonight. Just to uh, remind you, this is an opportunity to put your questions. Uh, is the president and founder of an organization called Answers in Genesis, and you can get onto the website and have a look at those. Um, 
particular articles and uh, maybe you can find the answers that you're looking for right there. It's a great uh, website. Uh, but tonight he's with us, so do take that uh, opportunity right now and send in your questions. Do keep them on topic, really with regards to anything you have uh, to, to do with the origins of man and uh, young earth in particular, why young earth is uh, so important to, to have that viewpoint. Ken, would you just give us your thoughts on this? Why uh, is it important to, uh, to take the young earth view or a young creation? Well, you know, in, let, let me just say this to start with. In Romans 10, we read, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart God has raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. It does not say, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart God has raised him from the dead, and believe in a young earth, we'll be saved. And, and I want to make that point to start with, because, you know, when I speak authoritatively about our stand on a young earth and the reasons for that, there are people that then try to make out that weird answers in Genesis say that you're not a Christian unless you believe in a young earth and that we make it a, a, a part of salvation and so on. And that's just simply not true. I mean, salvation is conditioned upon faith in Christ, uh, not what you believe about the age of the earth. And then people say to me, OK, so you can believe in millions of years and still be a Christian. Hey, there are many Christians that believe in an old earth. There are many Christians that believe in millions of years. And then they say to me, so it doesn't matter then. Yes, it does matter. And it matters because it's an authority issue. You know what, Howard? Look, if I was to go into even the average church in, in England, uh, the, the average church, uh, you know, conservative, relatively conservative church, say, main, mainline church, maybe that's what I could say. And I was to say, you believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ? And, and they would say, yes. Well, how do you know? Well, because the Bible says, yeah, but secular scientists say a man can't rise from the dead, right? So shouldn't we reinterpret that? Well, no, you can't do that. You believe in the virgin birth? Well, yes. Well, how do you know? You weren't there. Don't have a movie of it. You didn't talk to the angel. Didn't talk to Mary. Yeah, but we, the Bible says, yeah, but secular scientists say you can't have a virgin birth in humans. Shouldn't we reinterpret that? No, you can't. And I could go all the way through Scripture, and I'm sure if I was to say, do you believe that Jesus fed the, Isra the, the Israelites' manna in the wilderness? Yes, the Bible says. Do you believe Jesus walked on water? Yes, because the Bible says. Do you believe a man was swallowed by a fish? Uh, Jonah we're talking about, and lived in a fish for three days. Well, yes, the Bible says. Do you believe the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years, their clothes didn't wear out, their shoes didn't wear out, and their feet didn't swell? Well, yes, because the Bible says. But that goes against everything we observe today. Yes, but the Bible says those things. But as soon as you come to Genesis, and you say in this day and age uh, to most churches, well, God created in six days, and death came after sin, and, and then God took uh, dust and made Adam. He, you know, he took uh, his side and made woman. There was a global flood. Here's what you hear. Oh, no. Well, that, no, that's not so. No, well, may, maybe God used millions of years. Well, maybe it wasn't six days. Well, maybe it was a local flood. Well, maybe the fossils were laid down over millions of years. Well, maybe, maybe God used evolution or whatever. And the point I'm making is this. You don't get millions of years from Scripture. Millions of years comes from outside of Scripture, and you're added to Scripture. And the idea of millions of years anyway came out of atheism. In the 1700s, late 1700s, early 1800s, atheists and deists in England who were looking for a way to explain the fossil record without God, without the Bible, not using Noah's flood. And so they proposed this idea. It was laid down millions of years before man. But the fossil record... It's a record of death. You've got evidence of brain tumors, for instance, in dinosaur bones. You've got evidence of arthritis and evidence of cancer in bones. You've got evidence of animals eating each other. You've got thorns in the fossil record. Wait a minute. If you take the Bible as written, thorns came after the curse, and God said everything he made was, was very good. Uh, you, you, you know, originally the animals were all vegetarian, Genesis chapter 1, verse 30. You can't have millions of years of death, bloodshed, disease, suffering uh, before sin. And I, I believe what has happened is this. I mean, let's face it. Look at England. I don't know what church attendance is now, but I, I know before the last war it was, what, 40, 50 percent of the population. Now it's probably down 7 percent or less. Well, three. Three percent. Uh, three percent. I know that, uh, you know, Penguin Books... Uh, when they published the book called Killing God, I think it was, just three, four years ago, they did a survey and said two-thirds of young people say they don't even believe in God in England. Let's face it, something terrible has happened and something has happened to the church. And I believe it's this, if we can stand back and look from big picture, when the idea of millions of years came along, church leaders in England took the millions of years, added into the Bible, and said, well, maybe there's a gap between the first two verses, maybe God used... Uh, but, you know, the days are long periods of time, millions of years. Along came 
Darwin and they said, well, let's add that in and say God used evolution. Along came the Big Bang. Let's add that in and say God used the Big Bang. And although it didn't affect their salvation, which is conditioned upon faith in Christ, what it does do, it unlocks a door. It unlocks a door to say that in the next generation, this part of the Bible is not really true. It doesn't really mean what it clearly says. You can add ideas from outside the Bible. And when you unlock that door in one generation, the next generation tend to open it further and the next generation open it further. In fact, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul has a warning for us that Satan's going to use the same method on us as he did on Eve to get us to a position of doubting and not believing the Bible. And that method he used on Eve was to doubt the Bible. Did God really say? I believe the teaching of millions of years in particular and evolution. Uh, that's the Genesis 3 attack of our day. And yet, you know, Howard, think about this too. Richard Dawkins is so adamant of the millions of years. He scoffs at people who doesn't believe in that. So adamant evolution. Wouldn't you think from a perspective of Christianity that there's more on the broad way than the narrow way, uh, that men like us rather than light, when it comes to an issue of origins about who we are, where we came from, when we weren't there, wouldn't you think that we should be just a little bit suspicious of what the secular world says, what atheists are saying, what they are adamant about, that to them disproves the Bible and to them is, is a foundation for their atheism. I mean, it amazes me that so many of even the conservative leaders in England have adopted millions of years into the Bible and say that doesn't matter, it's not important. They don't understand. It's an issue of authority. They're undermining biblical authority. And that's why we've lost generations now who no longer believe the Bible can be trusted. I believe it's an important mm -hmm authority issue it is uh, and that's why revelation tv is, is so uh, adamant <laughs> uh, to get these points across and and does hammer them home as much as we can i have to say to our viewers as well uh, answers is genesis is going to be sending us some material that can be viewed and, uh, and one of those programs is going to be a weekly program uh, 60 minutes in duration so i uh, look forward to receiving those and i'm sure many of our viewers will also appreciate it you know, one of the things uh, I have uh, to deal with uh, sometimes on this air, on the airwaves is helping people to understand, as I said earlier, how to make a defense uh, when they uh, come up against the people like Richard Dawkins. And on the BBC in particular, they produce some excellent shows, uh, but they're always uh, pushing the evolutionary theory and definitely talk down or against uh, those who are Bible believers. For example, Ken, just recently, uh, it was in the news this week, um, Jeremy Paxman of Newsnight uh, fame, uh, he was uh, uh, interviewing uh, Richard Dawkins and uh, was saying that Christians and people who believe the Bible are basically idiots, uh, and especially when it comes to accepting uh, what the Bible says with regards to creation. Yeah, I, saw, I actually saw that. Uh, part of that interview, I was watching it, and uh, uh, it's, it, it, what he said to him was, so, you know, to, to Richard Dawkins, are, are you worried that there's so many stupid people around? And, of course, he was calling people in America stupid because so many of them still believe in God. Yeah. In Genesis. Well, um, I've got a very long email here. I'm going to try and pick the bones out of it because it does deal with some interesting things. Uh, it's from Bob. Harper in Switzerland. Thank you, Bob, for writing this. Well, I know it's with regards to something we dealt with recently, but he says last week I sent you an email about Darwin's biography. Remember, I think you both uh, missed the main point of my message, and that was that evolution was accepted then for political and sociological rather than scientific reasons. This fact is just as strong today. Uh, the flim flam tactics of evolutionists or uh, con men tricking people and me into believing that microevolution processes which are reductive in that they generally reduce the genetic information added together long enough become macroevolutive, adding new information thus uh, producing microbes in, to man. A thousand uh, misuses never get to become a plus even after millions of years. Simple mathematics, this is only one of dozens of scientific and plain logical proofs that evolution, as taught in our schools and universities, is simply a pseudoscience on par with astrology. And, and so he goes on, but he, he's, he's making the point that, you know, scientists and uh, philosophers of our day and super intellectuals don't seem to see through it. Um, but as he explains or says that Paul 
uh, in his letters to the Corinthians, in, in citing certain scriptures like 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and 19 and 2 Corinthians 4, says where he, re, uh, he records, it's recorded there, God allows Satan to blind the minds of the unbelievers, uh, stop the truth coming through basically. But this, thank you Bob for putting that. But with uh, what happened there back in Darwin's day, it did turn uh, people's thinking around, did it not? And probably is probably the one most responsible uh, for people losing their faith in a creator God. Well, you know, it, it, what's interesting uh, is how, for instance, you know, back in 2009, I think it was, yes, 2009, there was a movie that came out about Darwin's life called Creation. And I don't know whether you remember this, but Paul Bettany, who's an atheist, uh, was the actor who acted out Darwin. And it was about the life of Darwin. And in, in a part of the movie, uh, the, the man who's representing Thomas Huxley, and Thomas Huxley was the ardent secular humanist of the day, you know, Darwin's bulldog, it was called, because he promoted Darwin more than Darwin did himself. But he says in that movie, he says, you've killed God, sir. You've mm -hmm. killed God. And really, that's the essence of what evolution is all about. And that's how Dawkins sees it as well, uh, to kill God. And, and wh why do they so want that? Because, you know, from a, from a perspective of a Christian, of course, you know, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seek after God. Romans 1, they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And so from the perspective of man, th that is, we don't want the true God. And so we want to be able to uh, say that we can decide truth for ourselves. I mean, that was really what happened back in Genesis 3. You trust God or we become as our own gods. And that's what man wants. Mm -hmm. He wants his own God. And so evolution gave Huxley the justification for determining his own morality. Therefore, I can decide what is right and wrong. I can do what I want with sex and so on. And there's other quotes of, of his and other such people who show that that is very clear. That's what they want to do. In fact, you know, when I was just watching the video today of Richard Dawkins at the conference in Australia, at the Atheist Conference in Australia in April this year, he starts off by saying, we want to redefine morality. In other words, we want to decide what right and wrong is for ourselves. And he, and he actually said, we don't want some 3,000 year old book telling us what is right and what is wrong. In other words, we don't want God telling us what is right and what is wrong. That's really what Darwinian evolution is all about. And that's what it was all about back at the time of, of Darwin as well. It gave people like Huxley and others, of course, uh, justification for not believing in God and therefore not adhering to biblical morality. And by the way, you find the same today in regard to the marriage issue or the abortion issue or whatever. Uh, people know that if you're going to start with God's word, there's a basis for right and wrong. And marriage is a male and a female and abortion is killing a human being, which would be in contravention of, of what God's word says. So you know, there are some very serious implications here. And that's why that's why there's such emotionalism when it comes to some of these issues, because, you know, creation, evolution, creation versus evolution uh, and, 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 you know, creation, as, as the Bible tells us, and evolution in millions of years, it's really a conflict between uh, God's word and man's word. It's really a conflict between two different worldviews, one of moral relativism and the other of absolutes. And that's the clash that you see. And, you know, I find here, for instance, in America, I have people who say to me, well, wait a minute, your, your, your view of marriage, for instance, you know, we just had a big issue here in the States with a, a food chain called Chick-fil-A. I don't know whether you saw it on the news over there in England, but... Um, or in the United Kingdom, but uh, the, the president came out and said he, of this, of this food chain, not representing the chain itself in a sense, these are his personal views, but he said he believes in biblical marriage, a man and a woman, uh, male and female. Well, the secular humanists, there was furor across the nation and it, it, it caused a big stir. And what happened was people went en masse to support uh, the Chick-fil-A food chain restaurant yesterday and thousands of people all across the nation. It was quite incredible. Uh, to see what happened. But I, I had people who, you know, were telling me on my Facebook, you know, that I was intolerant of their view. Well, wait a minute. You know, when people accuse me of being intolerant, they say, you've got to allow all views. Well, my view is they're wrong, and, and I stand on God's word, and this is the right view. And they say, no, you can't have that view. You're intolerant of our view. Well, wait a minute. You're intolerant of my view. It's a clash <laughs> of views because it's a clash of two different starting points. Yeah. Because 
there's only two starting points. There's only two religions, God's word, man's word. You take God's word, you have a basis for absolute. Man's word, well, we decide what's right for, for ourselves. And, and you see, that's the clash. And that's really what it's all about. And I believe that's what the writer of this email is saying. And, and, and that's the essence of the argument right there. Yeah. Uh, well, here's a, a very foundational question to really uh, what the Bible is saying about a young earth or a young creation. Uh, how old is the earth and the six days, were they normal 24-hour days? This is from Darren. Now, I know you've answered this uh, must be millions of times, uh, but it is such an important question, and I'm glad that Darren's posed it. Okay, and let me deal with it in, in two ways, Howard. First of all, okay, if we assume, and, and I would just say to people, just let me do this for the moment. Let's assume that those days of creation, yeah, those six yeah, days, are ordinary just... days. Let's assume that, okay, number one. I'll come back to that in a moment. If those days are ordinary days. Day six, God made Adam. And then the Bible has, has very tight genealogies in the Old Testament. You know, Adam, when he was 130 years old, had a son, Seth. And then Seth had a son, Enosh, and tells you how old he was when he had Enosh. And so it goes on. And what happens is you can go down through those genealogies, and if you take them as having no gaps, which we would say in, in the Hebrew, not in the New Testament, which is different, but in the Hebrew, those genealogies, the word begat doesn't jump any generations, and we have reasons for believing that. If you add all that up, it comes to about 6,000 years. Uh, it doesn't come to millions of years. And you can put millions of years in those genealogies anyway. It would totally destroy them. Even thousands of years would destroy them. Even hundreds of years would destroy them. I but that comes to the assumption that the days are ordinary days. And that's the other issue I'd like to talk about and explain that, Howard. Yeah. You, you keep fading in and out on, um, on your signal there, just the audio. So I'm just make, make sure there's nobody using too much internet connectivity in your office or something, Ken, just uh, in case it's dragging this, uh, the quality down. Uh, let me ask this question. This is coming, no name. Is space exploring allowed in Christianity? Uh, and did Jesus ever mention humans traveling to, uh, through the cosmos? Um, so, interesting question. Uh, what would you like to say about that? Well, there's nothing in the Bible that says we can't explore space. In fact, you know, man was given dominion uh, over the creation. And I'd say as part of man, in, in part of man investigating the world, and investigating the universe, uh, you know, that's um, part of what uh, he does uh, for man's good and, and, and for God's glory and so on. Uh, the thing that I would, would say is this, that unfortunately, uh, a lot of space exploration today, and particularly, for instance, NASA in the USA, the reason for their space exploration is to try to prove that somehow life evolved in outer space and uh, they're looking for aliens in outer space and, and looking for evidence that somehow, you know, man came from the stars. So, you know, from that perspective, the, that philosophy is a wrong philosophy. If they, if they had uh, an understanding that God made the stars, that God uh, made them for, for his purposes and, and so on, so our exploration is to help understand more of the creation that God made, I think we'd find out a lot, of, a lot more things and put the money into some some decent research. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's sad to see so many millions of dollars wasted in trying to search for, you know, life in outer space and aliens. When the, and the Bible makes it very clear that uh, God's focus in regard to man is on, on this earth. The, the rest was made for his, uh, for his glory and, and the heavens reveal the glory of God. That's what they're there for. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether I was uh, looking at some of the uh, questions and uh, comments that are coming in, Ken. Did you answer the 24-hour day piece? No, I did. I'd like to get back to that if yeah. I could. If the sound's looking okay again. Yeah, just breaking up a little bit. Yeah, I don't know why that is because uh, we've got very high-speed connection here. Okay. Uh, I think what it might be, Ken, is it's just perhaps when you raise your voice a little bit that it actually hits a compressor and it sounds like it's diminishing the volume and therefore it's taking a while to, to get back to the normal threshold level. Uh, well, I can, I can talk a little softer. How is that? That's better. Yeah, let's try that just in case that's what's happening. Right. Um, when it comes to the days of creation, the six days of creation, uh, here's the interesting thing. 
uh, any day can have two or more meanings dependent upon context. For instance, I could say to you, you know, I came back on your show after being here and I'm sitting with my back in the back of a chair and, uh, you know, we, we might uh, come back again and do this again in the future and I've got a sore back, which is actually true. Uh, there's a good back that has a number of different meanings. But you know there's meanings from context. Now, when it comes to day, if I said, uh, for instance, that uh, back in my father's day, that means time, during the day, the daylight portion of a time, if I said it took me four days to drive across America, uh, that would be four ordinary days, four 24-hour days. So the word day has a number of different meanings. Now, the same is true in Hebrew. The Hebrew word for day, the word yom, has different meanings. Uh, in the day of the Lord, in the time of the judges, in the day that God created, in the day that you eat, you will surely die. Uh, the word there really means time, in the time that you eat. Uh, but the word day can also mean an ordinary day. It can mean the daylight portion of a day. Um, here's the point. We have to be asking ourselves, when does the word day mean an ordinary day? And in fact, the word day in the Old Testament is used 2,301 times in the singular and plural form. The interesting thing is, we know what, it's, what it means everywhere it's used, except it seems Genesis 1. We don't question what the word day means when, you know, Joshua marched Jericho in a day. We don't say, well, was that a hundred thousand years or a million years? I mean, we know what the word day means. We know when it means time. We know when it means day, except this is one. And yet what we find, the Hebrew rules, the Hebrew language, whenever the word day is qualified with a number, so you've got number plus day, or you've got evening and day, or you've got morning and day, or you've got the phrase evening and morning, or night and day, it always means an ordinary day. And for the first day, Genesis 1-5, you've got evening and morning and number and night, and you've got the word day, which means it's an ordinary day. And for each of the others, you've got evening, morning, and number uh, for each of the other five days. Uh, and even for the seventh day, you've got a number, which means they're all ordinary days. In fact, if you look up a Hebrew dictionary, uh, there's, there's two major ones, Brown Driver Briggs and Kohler Baumgartner, they all give the example they're, they're lexingtons that are used even in seminaries. They give the example of when does a word day mean an ordinary day? Well, the first example is Genesis 1-5 because there you have number, evening, morning, uh, night with the word day. And the point I want to make to us is the reason that Christians know what the word day means everywhere else in the Old Testament, but it's Genesis 1 we argue about, is because that's where you're trying to fit millions of years into the Bible. You see... Exactly. Mm millions of years in the genealogies and besides if you if you're going to believe in millions of years as a christian then the idea of millions of years comes from the fossil record the fossil record is said to be laid down millions of years before man so if you're going to take the secular view of the fossil record and add it into the bible you have to do it before man which means the six days of creation which means you've got to reinterpret the days and i'm going to say to you you cannot get away from the fact that the word day in Genesis 1 means an ordinary day. You can't fit millions of years in. And that's why we believe in a, in a young earth. You add up all the dates then, you get about 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's good to be reminded also of when the Lord spoke to Moses and said on the, on the seventh day you rest. Um, and that was obviously talking 24-hour days in, well, in that sense. Uh, Exodus 20 verse 11, the basis yeah. of the and, and think about it, uh, you know, God tells us why uh, he took six days. I mean, that's a long time for God to take, Howard. Think about it. He could create everything in one second. He could do it in no time at all. He struck it out. Wow, six days, that's a long time for God. And the reason he did, because that's where a seven-day week come from. You think about it. You know, we know where our day comes from, the rotation of the earth on its axis. We know where the month comes from, the earth and the moon, the year, the earth and the sun. The seven-day week is only one place, the Bible. That's where it comes from. That's why we have a seven-day week. Very good. Uh, this is rather a long email, so I'm just going to uh, praise it with uh, saying that it's really from uh, Mike, who's saying that the, the Bible, which is sitting here to my right on the table here, is something that we use uh, as, as, as with other presenters on Revelation TV and that we accept it, he says, in the inerrant, uh, word of God, which we do, but he's he's sort of complaining really about the fact that this is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, and that we're really um, you know foolish to actually take this uh, as as literally being um, it, the inerrant word of God. Uh, we know that from the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found, I think it was 1947. 
um, that there was uh, those copies that were made in there were there for a couple of thousand years, were they not, Ken? And that they had no real uh, difference in what we see uh, and read in our scriptures today. Well, yeah, and I mean, there's a number of factors that one has to talk about in regard to this. But first of all, there's the English translations or the German translations or the Spanish translations or whatever. Uh, we know that, you know, when you translate from uh, the original languages, the original language of Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and so on, mainly Hebrew and Greek, when you translate into another language, you know that you can have different ways of putting the same thing. So obviously it's going to be you know, lots of different translations out there. That doesn't mean that it's not the Word of God. It just means, you know, there's there's different ways of putting a sentence in English or in Spanish or, you know, French or, or whatever. Um, so that's the first aspect of it. And and that is that our, our translations um, are going to obviously uh, have some differences, but they won't, they should not differ in doctrine or teaching or anything like that. And, and and that's why, too, we have lots of study tools where we go back to the original Hebrew word or the original Greek word uh, so that we can uh, look at that. And, and that is what the translators do. Because uh, then the issue comes down to okay, we don't have the original autographs uh, because, you know, obviously we believe in the original autographs, that is the, the divinely inspired word of God. You know, like uh, 2 Timothy 3. Uh, says that uh, this is the scriptures that God breathed, and you know I, I I can't go out and you know to that person that that wrote to you and 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 prove that in the sense of you know physically prove it to you in an absolute sense uh, right now, uh, except that the Bible itself claims to be the Word of God. It says it is God breathed. It says men uh, were moved by God's Spirit to write down God's Word, and of course you know it, it, God has preserved. Uh, that, that word and and certainly with the Dead Sea Scrolls and other manuscripts that have been found it's been shown that uh, the Bible has certainly uh, been um, faith uh, preserved uh, in, in regard to its original writings I mean that is that is very obvious and that's a whole uh, science in itself and and see as Christians too you know, we, we can show that, hey, the Bible gives us, for instance, it gives us a very specific history in Genesis concerning creation, concerning the fall of man, concerning the flood, concerning the Tower of Babel. We can take that and, and apply it to the world and see if it does explain the world and see if observational science confirms it. And it does. You know, observational science confirms there's only one race of people when they map the human genome. That, that totally confirms we all go back to Adam and Eve. doesn't prove it in an ultimate sense. Uh, we can do the same for the flood. If there was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And, of course, that's what you find. And uh, we, we have flood legends and creation legends in cultures around the world that are similar to the Bible. And then you can get in, uh, because, because the Bible is the original, is what we would say, and they, they have elements of truth handed down from the Tower of Babel, but they've changed them. We could get into prophecy and all sorts of areas like that. And the fact that, you know, without the biblical God, what, how can you make sense of the universe? Why do we have the laws of nature? Why do we have the laws, laws of logic? Why do we have the uniformity of nature? It doesn't make sense without the biblical God. But in an ultimate sense, it's only God who opens people's hearts to prove that to them. If you come to him believing that he is, he will reveal himself to you. And, you know, without faith, it's impossible. Uh, the scripture says there's always, always a faith aspect. So all we can do is faithfully teach the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. We can defend the Christian faith. We can answer those questions and challenge people to take it seriously and challenge them to understand that they are sinners uh, alienated from God and uh, that God has provided a way of salvation for them. And here's what the scripture says. And we can give as and, and many answers as we can and direct them to the scriptures. But ultimately, it's God who does the convincing of, of of their heart. Mm. Mike does uh, point out uh, one particular uh, problem uh, with the, what the texts or verses that are included uh, in Mark, uh, from, uh, for example, from chapter 6, verse 8. It says the last 12 verses there are much later additions. They do not appear in any of the early texts and are also very different in style and inconsistent with the preceding versings, verses. With this in mind, uh, how can you still say that the Bible is inerrant? Well, you know, again, actually, we have some uh, materials that uh, that we uh, actually provide through our website. I think, um, and I think that particular section is discussed somewhere. But uh, there's one of one, you know, there's one of your uh, uh, pastors, uh, ministers over there in England, uh, Dr. Brian Edwards, who's written a book 
um, or maybe it's just Brian Edwards, has written a book uh, called Nothing But the Truth. And uh, he's written a couple of other books too, dealing with the uh, inspiration of Scripture and dealing with you know some of those supposed problems in the Bible. And I'm sure you know people can get his books uh, over in England quite uh, quite easily. Um, and, and he deals with uh, you know the canon of the Old Testament, the canon of the New Testament, but deals with some of those sorts of issues. And and the book Nothing But the Truth is is one that I'd recommend uh, for this particular person. But you know again. There's particular scholarship that would say those things that you just read out, but there's others that then would disagree with that for other reasons. And I don't have the answers to that one right in front of me, Howard. I, I know we have some material on our website, and we've got uh, a book called How Do We Know the Bible's True, and we've got some other things that are written. And, you know, there's lots of those sort of accusations that are made against the Bible and have been made over time. And uh, that's not to say that there aren't some difficult areas in the Bible, and it's difficult for some right. people mm -hmm. to understand some things, but, but there are have answers to those. That's what I'm saying. And yeah. I, would, I, I would direct the person uh, to, to those um, answers. There was just, uh, interestingly enough, Ken, last night we do a Bible study uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights live uh, on Revelation TV. And I was involved in the one yesterday. And, you know, we were looking at the Acts, the book of Acts chapter four, and it gives meticulous information about those who were present at the time uh, of G, uh, where, you know, when this was, uh, when Peter was uh, being brought before the Sanhedrin, uh, when you have the high priest uh, uh, and also other members of the Sanhedrin who were named specifically, and they're all sort of related. And when you look at the in depth that, that when you do the study on that, that Josephus even records these people as being uh, historical personages. And, you know, the, the Bible goes to great lengths in mentioning places, uh, people, events, timings, uh, and all the sort of genealogies that helps one to have, a, you know, the, a, a faith in the scriptures that you, you wouldn't get all of that information if it was a, a, something that was passed on in Chinese whisper style and it was written and rewritten and rewritten. It's something which you can trace if you want to. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I also refer people to, in, in America, there's a group called the Associates for Biblical Research. It's the most conservative archaeological group in the world, as far as I know. And uh, they written a lot of material and and you know there's been a lot over the years you know where people claim certain people in the bible didn't exist and then archaeologically they find evidence of them or mm -hmm. you know the no evidence of of david in 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 jerusalem and whatever and then they find evidence of of david and exactly. and, and, and so it goes on and you know there's a lot of material there so if people really want to research that they can there's a lot being written and and again they could do a search on the associates for biblical research if they're interested in archaeology uh, and, and get their website uh, over here in the USA. Yeah, brilliant. Well done. Um, this is from Graham uh, with regards to the Big Bang. He says, I don't wish or mean to cause any offense, but you still don't get it, do you? I'm currently talking in secret with an amateur scientist who can possibly and scientifically cast serious doubt over the Big Bang theory. But so what? This doesn't mean your view of creation is correct either. You carry the burden of proof. Uh, with you, um, and you don't have any, do you? Says Graham. Well, you know what? Uh, neither does he. Uh, and I think the, the bottom line is, uh, his name was Graham. I think you said uh, he yes. really, he really needs to understand the difference between observational science and historical science. And that's something that most people don't realise. You know, the word science means knowledge. Observational science is what builds our technology, what enables this computer to work. Hopefully it's working again, Howard, uh, and uh, the sound is working. Yeah. Uh, but it's of observational science. When it comes to uh, knowledge concerning the past when we weren't there, that's historical science. And there's no way I can absolutely 100% prove to Graham that God took dust and made Adam, took his side and made it Eve. I can't 100% absolutely right now in the present prove uh, to uh, Graham that there was a global flood. But the point is 
none of us can prove the past like that. We weren't there. We don't have all evidence. It's like a forensic scientist coming in and you got the evidence of a murder, but you don't know who did it. What you really would like is a witness who saw it happen, who you can trust, who doesn't tell a lie. Now, the Bible happens to be a book that claims to be the word of a witness uh, who's always been there, who doesn't tell a lie, who said, look, here's what happened to enable you to understand the present. And I would challenge Graham that the more that you take the Bible as the word of God and take that history is written and then you go out and look at the world and you look at observational science it confirms over and over again the Bible's account of history I can't prove that to you but I can do my best uh, to answer questions and to defend the faith and to show you that over and over again the Bible's history is confirmed then I'm going to challenge you that history really is true and therefore the gospel based on that history is true again I can't 100% prove that to you because I'm a finite human being and I don't know everything. I wasn't there, but I have a book that claims to be the word of one who does know everything. He's always been there. And the scripture also says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. If you study God's word and if you seek after God as you seek after silver and gold and, and, with, and, you, and, and you come to him in faith, believing that he is, he will reveal himself to you. You know, it's like... To me, it's like uh, the tomb of Lazarus. When Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, he said, move the stone away. Now, Jesus, being the son of God, he could have spoke one word and moved that stone away. But what humans can do, God gets humans to do. And then what humans couldn't do, God did. He spoke and was God's word that raised Lazarus from the dead. And really what I look on what we do at Answers in Genesis and what we're doing even on this program, how it is we're moving the stone away. We're helping to give answers and to defend the faith, pointing people to the word of God. But it's God's word that raises the dead. It's God's word uh, that saves. And uh, so, you know, I again challenge Graham that, um, yeah, he can say that we don't ultimately 100% have the ability to prove right now what happened in the past. But neither does anyone, and that's the point. It really comes down to a matter of, of belief that is true. It comes down to a matter of faith that is true. But I would say that Richard Dawkins' faith is a blind faith because observational science does not support it, whereas Christian's faith is, is not a blind faith. It's an objective faith. Uh, obviously, when you look at DNA, it cries out in the beginning God because it's an information system and a language system and information only comes from information. Languages only come from an intelligence. So DNA does not confirm in the beginning hydrogen. It confirms in the beginning God. It doesn't prove it 100%, but that's the point. We can never do that. And uh, so my challenge to Graham is to separate out historical science from observational science and recognize he has belief aspects, as I do, uh, and we both have you know, uh, therefore different beliefs that determine how we interpret the evidence. But what we've got to look at is, you know, do we have the right starting point? Is our starting point God's word, man's word? Uh, and I challenge people that there's only one right starting point, and it's God's word. Mm. And with that, for, for Christians, uh, when we read the scriptures, we see so many references to the term that our God is a creator God, and it's someone that uh, made things with a purpose specifically and according to their kinds um, and the uh, same as humankind uh, and it's incredible when you look at the body the way that it works uh, uh, it is it's too incredible uh, I, I, for me as a layman just to believe that that came about uh, through a process of evolution I, I, there's too many holes uh, in it uh, but when I read and I have faith in the scriptures and it's not just accepting it willy-nilly and saying well okay you know you just want to believe there are things in there you test for yourselves and and how many of you let me challenge you that those that actually say the bible um is something that you 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 don't want to accept but how many of you have read it and will you read it because so many people that have read the scriptures to try uh for another motive to try and disprove it have actually come to a different conclusion and that is they've become believers in the word of God as uh, it being, you know, accurate, especially when you, you, you line it up with some of the things that you see in, in secular history even. But look at what some of the, the writers have said, the, the historians like Josephus. Um, and so just challenge you to read the scriptures for yourself. Uh, there's a, so many emails and text come in i'm going to apologize in advance again that we'll, we'll try our best uh ken will be 
with us for another approximately 28 minutes. Ken, this is an hour and a half, this show at the moment. Uh, Howard uh, and Ken, um, think evolution versus creation is a salvation issue, uh, like I do, says Raz. Well, you did deal with that in the beginning, Ken, didn't you? You actually said that you don't think it's a salvation issue. Well, well it's, it, you know, I challenge people, it's not a salvation issue per se. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, uh, what salvation is conditioned upon faith in Christ. It's not conditioned upon what you believe about the age of the earth or what you believe about uh, evolution. You know, people can be inconsistent in all sorts of ways. I mean, we're human beings. We're finite. We're sinful. None of us has a monopoly on the truth in that sense. Um, and But here is where, where it sort of, uh, what would I say, impinges on, on salvation in this way, and that is, you know, it, I look at it this way, that the, a lot of the older generation who, in America, for instance, grew up in a more of a Christianized America with a Christianized worldview, that would be true in England, too, to a degree, um, years ago, uh, they, they don't understand as much uh, what's happened, because many of them might have believed in millions of years or maybe believed in the gap theory or the day-age theory or whatever, and they can do that and you know but they committed their life to christ they're born again as the bible says it didn't affect their salvation but what it does affect is how the next generation themselves view scripture and if they start to doubt scripture because of evolution and and millions of years they start to doubt that you can really believe the history in the bible then and you know how do you know the rest is true uh, it puts them on that slippery slide of unbelief so it affects salvation in the sense that generations uh, subsequent generations, there are people that start to say, well, the message of the gospel is not true because the book it comes from is not true. And that's where it affects the message of salvation. But it is an, an issue of authority. So it's not a salvation issue per se in the sense, you know, if you believe in evolution, some people say, well, can you be a Christian? Well, there are many Christians that believe in evolution. You know, there are many Christians that believe in, in millions of years. I mean, the founder of the Free Church of, of Scotland, Thomas Chalmers, for instance, believed in the gap theory. In fact, some say they believe he invented, you know, the gap theory to fit millions of years uh, into the Bible. Even Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, uh, believed in, in the early years, at least, believed in the, and seemed to, and what he did, talk about the uh, millions of years and seemed to believe in the millions of years and some sort of gap uh, idea as well. Uh, that doesn't mean he wasn't a Christian, not at all. I believe he was inconsistent in that area. Uh, even though he, he was, you know, his preaching is head and shoulders above, you know, most of most of us, of course, today. Uh, so I hope that sort of answers the question. It's, it's not a salvation issue per se; it's an authority issue. Well said. Um, personally, I, the way that I view this, Ken, is that I think that uh, one can lose one's faith if you listen to the evolutionary uh, arguments, because it would undermine your faith in Scripture, and therefore you would fall away as it were, um, and therefore, in that sense, it is a salvation issue because you um, may just turn away from God. Well, you know, um, you may have heard of Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton was a great evangelist back in the 50s, like Billy Graham, mm -hmm. and he would crusades. In fact, I remember when I spoke in, I think it was Charlotte Chapel over in Edinburgh, Scotland, a few years ago, and I stood in the pulpit there, and they said, hey, do you know Charles Templeton stood in that very pulpit where he was standing? Well, Charles Templeton uh, went to Princeton uh, at about the same time, you know, Billy Graham was taking off in Australia. Charles Templeton was doing those crusades too, but he went to Princeton, and at Princeton, he was taught millions of years, and there was all this death and struggle millions of years before, uh, before man, and he started to recognize, how can you believe in a loving God? I mean, if, if God's responsible for all this death and struggle and animals ripping each other up and so on, he can't be a loving God. And so Charles Templeton totally walked away uh, from Christianity, having been one of those evangelists running these big crusades and, and seeing people come forward and so on. And he wrote a book called Farewell to God, which atheists use today. Uh, and uh, Charles Templeton died, as far as I understand, a very, very sad man, very uh, agnostic and unhappy man. But just to show you the influence uh, that the teaching of evolution of millions of years has on such people. Mm -hmm. Lucy writes in, uh, says, good evening, by the way. Uh, please could you answer this question? If humankind is meant to be deteriorating physically, intellectually, and morally since the origin uh, of sin, why... Uh, 
is measured intelligence increasing in every generation and why are world records still being broken at the London Olympics? And this is from Lucy. Um, well, I, I think uh, we could answer that in a number of ways. First of all, um, do we have any records from before the flood to know what people were like before the flood, for instance? Well, actually, we don't, uh, so we don't know. Uh, I mean, when you go back in the, in the Bible and uh, look at... Um, uh, look at Adam and Eve and then their descendants were making musical instruments and, and so on. They're obviously extremely intelligent. Uh, 